Okay, so we're ready to get started here. Good afternoon on this uh, wintry day here in Austin, Texas. I, of course, we are very fortunate in that we hardly ever get winter, not uh, compared to the rest of the country. So a little bit of cold air actually feels kind of brisk and has uh, gotten us all uh, energetic today. We've been doing a uh, solar lab all day uh, in the back. Uh, this is something that we normally do outdoors, but because of the difficult weather, uh, we actually did it all indoors because we actually have the ability to generate what we call inside sunshine. Uh, we have these big uh, bulbs uh, overhead. It gives us enough uh, a light uh, to actually commission an entire PV system as well as do our module experiments. So we've been doing that, and uh, so we're being joined uh, by that uh, that lab. Uh, but what we want to do is go ahead and segue uh, to our special guest today. Circular Energy. Circular Energy was identified by the Austin Business Journal as the third fastest growing company in Central Texas. And uh, that uh, designation uh, also was, well, they were also the only solar company that was actually on that list uh, uh, as far as uh, the top 50. This is Austin Business Journal. And so today we actually have the CEO and founder of uh, Circular Energy. Uh, J.C. Shore. Uh, he actively is directing the company's expansion strategy and the execution of its service and financing platform across both residential and commercial markets. Uh, in addition, uh, he has brought his uh, president and general counsel, uh, Brad Thompson, and they're going to do a very interesting topic today. You know, instead of diving into maybe some of the technical details of solar photovoltaic system design and installation, actually going to talk about the culture that they've been able to create within their company that has fueled their growth. With that, I turn it over to J.C. Short. Thank you. Thank you. First off, thank for, thank for having us. Um, kind of a tough day to talk about solar with the weather, and then the timing is going to be worse. You know, I, I went to UT and a Longhorn band, and our president, Brad, went to Baylor and he was a bear band. And when uh, we found out, and for those of you, any college football fans in here? Good. Three, three, six. Okay. okay. No more sports. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're kind of, uh, kind of, kind of on the in this in the game. Um, but that's what, that's what the DDR was. Um, anyway, yeah, we're going to talk to you guys a little bit about building uh, a brand or culture. You know, we're trying to figure out what topic might be interesting instead of just you know talking about solar or incentives or rebates or you know market growth. And just just thought it'd be kind of cool to talk about something different that I bet isn't typically talked about. It's not talked about in most companies. It certainly isn't talked about much in the solar industry. So you know, something that's kind of near and dear to my heart uh, that, that uh, we'd love to get, you know, share with you guys. So first off. You know, I'll talk about just a little bit in general, just kind of, you know, not industry specific. We'll tell you just a tiny bit about circular, and then we'll talk about what, what building brand, uh, what building brand, um, you know, kind of looks like. I think this, you know, kind of first quote is interesting. You know, is it, uh, can you guys see it? Right here. Yeah. All right. In the absence of a meaningful difference, the cheapest brand is typically regarded as the best choice. Think about that for a second. You know, in the solar industry, I, I think the last thing I saw was 6,200 companies, maybe 67, I don't know what this data is showing here. Today, over almost 8,000 solar companies, um, you know, across the United States. It's hard to track. I mean, this is from SIA, maybe there's, you know, less, maybe there's more. But that's a ton. And what happens if we're all playing that game? There's no meaningful differentiators. We're all competing on price. How fun is that going to be? And by the way, how long does that last? And if you look at other industries, it doesn't last long. We all know the you know, story of the local hardware shop, right? And Home Depot comes in and they're gone. Unless they have a meaningful differentiator, and there are some that do. So you've got to figure out what it is that's going to you know, differentiate your company. For those of you thinking about in, in, entering the, the solar industry, or maybe you're already part of the company, what is it that makes your, your company special? There will be room for some of those companies that play the price, have the absolute lowest price. There'll, there'll be some winners, but I don't think there'll be 6,200 or you know, 8,000. They could be a dozen. Well, just, you know, talking about the different kind of solar companies, and again, this is you know JCism, so I, I don't know that these are, are right or wrong. But just you know, some of the kind of I don't know categories that I would put maybe you know, some solar companies into some possible winning strategies, if you will. 
you know, this idea of solar in a box. There's a really neat company out of uh, Louisiana uh, doing 1,800 residential installs. If I'm not mistaken, they're all 4.2 kW systems. They have their own customer acting system that they invented. They say they can do three installs a day. I don't believe that because the internet connection and everything, but they're close. And I mean, they just got this process done. Everybody gets the same thing no matter what. That, that can work. And I don't know if it can work just in Louisiana when the state tax credit does work, but it's a it's a viable strategy. You can do that not not that far away from what you know Home Depot do. There's a you know one size fits all solar for everybody, really cheap, easy, you know, repeatable process. Um, obviously, we're all you know familiar with the the solar city model, um, you know, the TPA, the third party ownership. Somebody else, um, you know, owns owns your system and you pay by the market you go. Keep the price down. More of a you know kind of leasing or renting your system from somebody else. Um, you know, specialty applications, those companies that specialize in, you know, kind of deep woods, off the grid, you know, backwards main kind of solar system for people that are remote. There's actually a pretty strong demand out there uh, across the United States for that. Um, those people can make money. You know, we talked about the low cost provider, obviously, you know, trying to, to be the absolute cheapest there is in the market. And then, you know, this idea of high service. And this one, you know, is interesting. I'm going to dive into this a little bit, but this was, you know, the brand that we actually want to try and create for circular energy when we started this company. It wasn't a solar idea that struck me. It was, it was really looking at other industries. Think about, you know, any other industry that you, you know, as a consumer, whether it's uh, your your telecommunications, whether it's travel, um, you know, just shopping online. There's, there's always these kind of insurance. There's always these companies that show up at the very, very top. You know, USA is consistently ranked in the kind of top ten worldwide is, uh, you know, for their, their service brand. Amazon is always ranked at the top. Um, yeah. So what is it that these companies do that make them different? And can, can you really be a can you really be a you know a high service you know high value provider in the, in the solar industry? Where, where are you going? If I can you back it up. Yeah, I think I can. Um, so it's interesting that previous slide that had 8,000-ish people kind of playing this market in this last slide. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. okay. This one? This one, yeah. This one right here. That one. <laughs> so, uh, uh -oh. All right. so, you know what I'm talking about, the, the, the different pockets of types of companies <laughs> that I think uh, can and will be successful. I was talking with Mike, Mike? Sure. Yeah, Mike and Cheryl before we got started about you know, the interesting thing that's happening in this industry is kind of this rising high phenomenon. And I think a lot of companies, you know, that are quote solar companies at first, not that we're any, we were any different for first either at circular, but I think we tried in the get go to kind of pick which segment of that market we were trying to be in. And I think the interesting thing for uh, the number of people that are kind of scrambling to be in the space now because the industry is growing is there's plenty of room for those, all of those types of companies to, to be competitive. And I think the more that we can do, meaning we, Circular, and all the other companies that you might slot in, one of JC referenced the kind of solar in a box model, the more that we can kind of identify ourselves what type of company we're trying to be, uh, the more we can actually help the entire industry better. So that we, Circular, aren't trying to compete for the solar in a box company, and then that company is not trying to you know, they've got a customer who wants to do something really unique and very different. And we're finding already uh, here in Austin and Central Texas across the state that even companies that on that slide of 8,000 quote unquote competitors are wanting to partner more with us because they've got uh, clients and customers where we can kind of help them more. And on the same token, they might be serving, servicing a segment of the market that we can find. Yeah, and, and thanks for saying that. That's kind of an important point, right? There's nothing wrong with any of these models, but you better have one. You better be thinking about it. Because if you don't, you're relegated to, you know, option E, the low cost. And if it, you truly are the low cost and you've figured out how to, you know, uh, streamline your back office operations and all of your infrastructure and your workflow and, and automate that stuff, you can be a low cost provider. But if you're not making those investments, and by the way, that's a chicken and an egg. You know, problem, right? If it were the low cost provider, you would assume we have low margin, we have low margin, how much money do we have to invest? And the things we need to do to operationalize, operationalize ourselves to be efficient, if it's not good, you've got to have a lot of investment. So now I'm going to go forward. 
Okay. So, you know, this is what I call the kind of the, you know, the, the customer service policy. I, I think what's really interesting, uh, before I started this company, there, there weren't that many solar companies in Austin. I think today there's over 50 maybe. Is that right? I don't know. You know, over 50 companies here. Back when we started, I think there were 14. So kind of the last thing, you know, Austin needed was a 15 you know, solar company. Um, today, of course, you know, a lot more. But I talked to some of the owners of, of some of those companies. I've kept in touch with some of the people, you know, along the way. You know, it's always fun to ask, you know, the CEO or the president of another solar company here, if they'll share the information with you, or in Dallas, or, you know, it gets easier as we get up to other states where we're not competing, and, and talking to them and sharing information. And you ask them, what difference did you guys? And 25% of the time, you get one of those answers on the slide that we were looking at before, right? We have the, and they don't call it solar a lot, that's my name. You know, we have the solar in a box, we have the, um, you know, the, the low cost advantage. But most of the time, they'll tell you we have the best service. It's the same freaking answer every single time. We have the best service. What does that mean? If it's meaningful and you really have the best service, okay. But, you know, I, I think, the way, the true test, the true litmus test for service is if you've monetized it. And I'm not going to stand up here today and talk about, you know, our gross margin versus somebody else's gross margin. That's not the goal. But, you know, you can go look on, 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 online and do some research and figure out what's the average gross margin in the industry. And, you know, four years ago, it was around 17, just under 17%. Today, it's uh, just south of 15%. And gross margin, for those of you that don't know, is total revenue minus uh, direct costs. Right, so it's the you know, cost of goods sold for the product. Um, you know, players in other industries that have high service have figured out how to monetize their 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 brand, their service. And I think that you know, it's circular is certainly something you know, we try to do. But it's a really good test. Uh, you know, I guess in terms of what I've called this intellectual honesty, looking at your company, looking at what you're doing, and seeing if you really have figured out a way to monetize that service, that brand. Okay, so just real quickly about Circular, uh, just so you guys know kind of who we are, um, what we do. We are a solar company today in the major markets of Texas, um, Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio. We're kind of contemplating a couple uh, smaller markets in, um, in Texas and then also expanding uh, south of the border of Mexico. I think we're pretty happy in those two territories that are you know, coming here. Oh, what is company culture? Okay. So I just want to go around the room if there's any brave souls in here. Just kind of tell me what you think the definition of culture is. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm going to give you my answer in a minute. It's probably different. But any volunteers, please? <laughs> Not one? Oh, here we go. All right, go. You go first. OK, well, um, I, I came from the city of I worked for local and for a few years. And that, that was a really strange company. You know, it's so large and micro culture. All throughout the company, and and, and, it's, and I'm moving around one to the divisions. And the first division I was in, it was 68,000 uh, lot of street core and people come along and get stuff on the small side and everything. And then I moved into the failure analysis, and it was just a drudge. Yeah. And it, it, it was backstabbing, and uh, the culture was like it was like all, 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 one room to the other, and it's like. So you would say, you know, you do need to do this. Yes, that's all. Sorry, I hand it over here. I think we have one definition. That's fine. Company culture. Yeah. That's what I have to add to the knowledge share. Okay, good. And then it's an excellent definition. Anybody else? No? Okay. So, you know, I pulled up, I, I just Googled, you know, company culture, and I got a bunch of stuff. And I put them in red, not because they're wrong, just because it's not what I believe. Uh, but, but it's, you know, I put these in red. And it's, you know, look, almost exactly verbatim what you said. A really good definition of company culture. Um, the values and behaviors that contribute to the unique, unique social and psychological environment of an organization. Perfectly acceptable definition. I'm not going to read them all to you. But for us, I thought, what about if it's your brand? What if it's actually your brand? What if you talk about your culture so much and make it such a part of the DNA or the nucleus of your people that that, that shows through in everything you do with your, your, your customers, your partners, the vendors that you buy things from, that pay on time, 
Um, it's your brand. That's what I believe. So, you know, what is this will be a little bit of lag here. Now how do you build how do you build culture? And then more importantly, how do you scale it? Because that's what's keeping me up at right? As we venture into Mexico, how do we take what is so cool here and make it happen? Sort of moving people from here down there, which you know, it's it's tough. But I think there's some you know common things that have to happen. You have to have a purpose, you have to have the right leadership, you gotta have the right people. And you have to have the right intent. And we're just going to dive into these just a little bit and kind of talk about what each one of them is. First one, you know, talking about uh, purpose. I think understanding that it's not my purpose, but that it's ours. You, you see a lot of companies, not, and this isn't solar specific, guys, this is, you know, any business, where the CEO or the president make a huge mistake of hiring themselves. And it's not, that's a huge, huge, huge mistake. Uh, it, it can't be JC company or, or, or Brad company. It's got to be the people's company. Everybody in the organization has to feel like it's, it's there. That they own that brand. It's not the brand that I'm telling them we have to do. It's the brand they believe in, the brand that they want to work with, more the brand that they're you know, killing themselves for because they believe. Got someone over here shaking their head. And going to do that right um, you know, the next thing is to teach it and demonstrate. And that's probably the hardest. If you agree that all humans make mistakes, and you know, if you acknowledge yourself as human, and I do, um, it is so hard to tell people 100% of the time, or show people 100% of the time what that brain looks like. Because we have bad days. We wake up in the morning, we roll out of bed on the wrong side of the bed, and you know, it's kind of the poopy pants, and we don't really give our, our people the, the right vibe. And, and you know, I think to have a couple bad days here or there, um, to have some bad moments here or there is fine. But, you know, you have to be the right example. You've got to teach it and demonstrate it for people. I think, um, well, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, you know, and the other thing, too, is we're different in the way we think. We have left brain people and, and right brain people. We have, you know, kind of analytical people and creative people. Uh, the president of Circular is very analytical and likes details. The president of our software division, Eric Norwood, used to build uh, rocket ships. He's just like Brad, um, very, very analytical. And I'm a little bit more, you know, intuitive. Um, so for, you know, someone like me, this stuff just feels good, and I just talk about it, and, you know, everyone does it up. For people like Brad and Eric, it's no good. They, we've got to measure it. We have to actually have some metrics around this stuff that equate to what good culture is. So you have to have a way to kind of define uh, what I would call, you know, success criteria so that you can communicate to everybody in the company. I hope I didn't miss category. No, you didn't. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is never stop talking about it. You know, we do these things called um, uh, all hands meetings, you know, once a month or almost uh, every month. But we get our team together and we talk about this stuff. And it's not, you know, just a raw, raw moment. There's some, you know, tough stuff that we talk about, some tough love, uh, some disappointments that we share, learning moments that we share. But what can we do to instill that sense of, of purpose and culture? And talk about it all the time. So, you know, within the teams, within the performance criteria of the team members, um, and how they're evaluated, and then, you know, just from, you know, one place, getting all the employees together. Why don't you talk to me? You don't gloss over that, I think, it's an important point when you talk about the challenge of trying to scale culture. And so now we're no longer kind of just a, a little Austin company. Uh, and so we've made an additional investment because we believe in our culture that when we have these meetings, we bring all of our employees here, and that's expensive. We have employees who don't live here. Uh, we have employees from Houston and Dallas, et cetera, and we want them to be here. And, and when he says employees, just to be clear, I mean, from the master electrician to me and JC and everybody, all along sales engineering, it's very important to us that everyone be there to be a part of it. And I think there's kind of a lip service of doing it, and then there's the actual investment as a company behind it. And to be candid with you, I think it's going to be one of our biggest challenges uh, going forward because it's very difficult to build that culture and brand and remarkably easy to lose it. So. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it does. It keeps me up at night. I actually am comfortable telling you guys that I haven't figured it out yet. And neither is Brad and neither is anybody else in our company. We don't know how we're going to do it. We're worried about it. And I think that's typically a good thing because I think we should be paying attention. Got some ideas on, you know, betting they won't work. But we'll figure out what we'll do and we'll make it. Because you know what? Other companies have done it. 
um, there's a lot of other companies out there that have them. And I think, you know, to try and emulate them and do what they've done is, uh, you know, will be informative to us as we continue to grow. You know, next one, I love this slide for those of you on the back that can't see it. You know, talking about leadership is another way to, to, to build culture. There's a picture of a, you know, this uh, kind of chariot almost or something. Building a pyramid. Building a pyramid. Thank you. Yes, actually, it is. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, you've got the the boss and the CEO sitting up there at the top, and everybody else, you know, working like carrying the carrying the, the weights. And then you know, a picture uh, on the bottom of, of the leader, um, you know, carrying the team and doing the work, and nobody sitting on the pedestal. I mean, I believe in this so much. Larry, um, when I got out of school. I worked for one of these big six consulting firms. They, you know, they were hybrid accounting firms or consulting firms. Uh, Ernst & Young, the Williams to Anderson Consulting, now called Accenture. Uh, I worked for one of those. And, you know, the first day, it was just like that, that movie Boiler Room, where they come in, you know, with your keys and say, you worked your, your ass off for 14 years, you can own this $600,000 car, and, you know, be a partner and make all kinds of money. And they did that at your law firm, too, uh, when you got to school. Brad, Brad here, uh, who's our president, is also our general counsel. He worked for one of those, you know, white shoe New York uh, law firms where you work to pay a lot of the drive, and then someday you can make partner. And he did make partner before he uh, decided to be crazy and come over the circuit. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, 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 was, it was really weird working there because there were different styles of leaders. There were different types of partners. The, the partners were the reigning, you know, kind of, Supreme leaders in these in these organizations, and my first experience working for one of the partners was the pyramid. Right, partners at the top come in for two hours, tell everybody what's going on, go play golf with the client. The senior managers uh, work more, the managers work more, the senior staff work even more. And they get drunk, eighty hours in the, eighty hours a week. And I'm not kidding when I say eighty hours. It was between eighty and eighty-five. Any less, you don't make it to senior. And you have to have good results. So you know, that was fine. A little hair on your chest, grow up, you know, try and turn into a man. I mean, I think that's fine. But I also had some other partners later on that I worked for that I also worked 80 hours a week. So today, they were sitting there with us solving problems, and we couldn't get their problems solved. They wouldn't come in and tell us what was wrong and how to fix it. They would stay there with us and show. That's leadership. And we've had some people come into our organization. I mean, talking about you know people being their biggest assets. Um, and we've had this growth, and we've done some hiring, as you can imagine. We started out with, you know, me and a guy named Vincent Guerrero. Today we've got 57 employees. Um, you know, we've hired more than 57 employees. And it's hard getting the right people. Not everybody works out. You know, we've got some people into our company that, on, on paper, they look brilliant. Uh, to the investors, they look like a huge success to have this, you know, high-powered, I'm not going to say, you know, title or whatever, they don't want to consult anybody. But, you know, we're bringing somebody in with, you know, some better than cash. And they come in and they don't need that one. It's the you know, smartest guy in the room scenario, or it's the uh, I mean, it's how everybody else wants to do this scenario. And you know, it's toxic to the organization. It does not work. I mean, it's so hard to fire people or let them go or suggest that they move on. But you know, we have to do that. Really, if we're about protecting the culture and the brand, then we have to protect the people. And we to protect the people, we can't have somebody bring it down. Maybe you talk about these topics. I don't know if it's the next comment. I'm going to talk about the topic. Now that we're at the point where they almost understand, I'm going to talk about that. And so, yeah, you know, it, 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 that was kind of my hope, right? Is that we could come in and talk to some people. I mean, I think this is such an interesting subject beyond solar. You know, whether it's electrical contracting or you know, airline industry, or, you know, it applies to everybody. You know, what do you believe and how do you how do you run the company? How do you want to succeed? There's other ways, but you know, I'm just sharing with you guys my heart and what I believe. Uh, but yeah, and, you know, sometimes regrouping can be the best thing in the world. You know, pulling my standards are different than the basic employees. Um, and my standards, my uh, customer service. Is a lot higher than what they want to provide. It's hard to meet that standard. Yeah. And, you know, and my name is on everything. 
Right. And the mind is circulated or you've got somebody that's not representing the name. The higher standard is the end. That's what we're running on my mind. Right. Right. And I think there's a way to get the employees to share that burden with you. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, thanks for sharing that, by the way. Um, so the next, you know, the next thing here is that uh, the box up there. What do you want? <coughs> Are we frozen? All right. So again, you know, we talked about kind of the third aspect where it's the, the people. And just some rules. I, you know, pull these off the internet. These are these are my rules. Um, you know, but don't hire from the business. Hire for the business. And that's been painful. That's been expensive. It's been painful, and it's caused us to make so many mistakes. Um, you know, the smartest thing when you're starting a business and you're getting into a field that you don't know anything about is to go get somebody else who does. And help them help you. So I did. Um, my first employee, our first employee, uh, was a guy named Vincent Guerrero. He was working for a, another solar company here in, in, um, you know, in Austin, Texas. I've uh, been there about three or four years. He's a hardcore engineer by, by trade, but you know, knew the solar industry, liked it, and so we brought some knowledge in. Between the two of us, we knew about like one tenth of one percent of everything we needed to know. To build a, a solar company, so you know the second hire was to go out and get another solar person, but we didn't. We hired somebody who was also an engineer. We had a lot of engineers in a very good company, which I love. Um, but we got another engineer who knew nothing about solar. He never seen the cost. The fourth employee was an architect. The fifth employee was a teacher. Uh, the sixth employee was a construction guy. So I mean, we had no solar people, and it's not because you know we thought the solar industry was bad. It's just that we were trying to build a brand that was different. And when we went into that labor pool, they weren't thinking the way we wanted to think. We wanted people that had the same mindset. So you can imagine the training nightmares is, you know, trying to pull these people into the company that they don't really know anything about. It's expensive. It takes a lot of time. It's not for everybody. I can promise you that. But if you can do it, um, then it's cool. If you're really hiring for the company that you want to build, not, you know, from other companies that have already built it, Put some, you know, cool concept into people's minds. Nice. Um, you know, another thing I do when we're interviewing, still we're at the point we're small enough so where I can meet. I have the luxury of meeting um, every single employee we have. Now we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated with our recruiting. Just you know, after kind of our experience, I was sharing with you guys a little bit about the loss person, you know, the people we've had to let go. It is so sophisticated to hire someone, bring them. And then, you know, either have them leave or find out that, you know, they're not a fit and you didn't have to do it again and again and again. So it's a very expensive uh, proposition to hire the wrong people. So we want to get good at, you know, doing that. We, um, I think, improve our recruiting and hiring processes a lot. I still don't think we're, you know, the kind of friend yet at all. We have a lot of uh, work to do to get there. Uh, but, you know, it's now a lot more complicated process, a lot more people from the company involved in interviewing the candidate. I get to talk to them at least once or twice. Um, you know, one of the things I always tell them at the end is don't, do not come to search for energy as a job. Don't come here for the money because we don't pay. Don't, don't <laughs> come, I'm kidding. But, um, you know, don't, don't come here for the job. The people say come here for the company. Come here because you believe in the company or the brand. Um, we've had so many people in our company that we hired in to do this job, and now she's on her fourth career in the search for energy. You know, maybe one of them because she wasn't good at it. Actually, the person I'm thinking of right now is good at all. But it's just, you know, gosh, you get you get an inner circle of people you can trust. They can do anything. And there was a really good, um, I can't think of his name. Okay, I won't. Um, you know, this uh, financial services banking company. I, just, I can't think of the guy's name right now. But he takes his top management and every two years gives him a new job. And it's so frustrating to them because just when they get good at doing their job, they're on the top of and, and uh, you know, I want that flexibility as an employer, as, as, uh, as a company that, um, you know, needs to be nimble and adapt to the changes that we're seeing. I want to be able to come to you and you and me and say, hey, you guys want to go to Mexico City? Or if the company would like you to go to Mexico City and you're ready to go. Because you love what we're doing. You love the brand. You love, you know, the, the, the deal. Not, not the job that you came to accept. So, again, that's not for everybody, but it's really important to 
you know, get people to kind of uh, abide by that or, or, or believe in it. And then, you know, I think lastly is is making sure you're available, right? If we're, if we're trying to focus on the people to build a brand or a social kind of culture, you have to have just an immense amount of patience and time. You can't be an absentee CEO or president or business owner or um, manager. You have to be there for your employees because if you know, I've got this culture that I figured out that I like. How are we going to get to make you your time? Spending, investing the time with the people. So you know, I always think of kind of this idea of not managing your employees to manage you know your own time for your employees. Give as much as you possibly can to them to to invest in. It pays off uh, almost all the time. It pays off really good thing. Um, all right, and then the last one, you know, is 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 incentives. Um, you know, some of the common incentives you'll see. These aren't necessarily circular incentives. I recognize a few on there, but you know, healthcare, gym memberships, unlimited time off. Um, you know, phone allowances. What else on it? You know, I don't know. Daycare, uh, uh, car allowances. These things sound good, um, and they're really easy, by the way, to recruit people if you have. Them. People get excited about this, you know. Oh wow, you have a gym membership, or you know, you do a phone allowance. That sounds that sounds really cool. They come here and last like a week, or you know, I can pay you five hundred thousand dollars a year, and that lasts like a week. It's never enough for people, ever, ever, ever. These are not the incentives that last. They don't endure, and they really don't mean anything. Even though you guys are probably thinking I'm crazy right now. I, I assure you, I'm not. I've seen this so many times, even before you know we ever started circular. The incentives that matter are the intrinsic ones. Those are those are extrinsic rewards. The intrinsic rewards are a lot more interesting to me. There's a guy out there uh, named Dan Pink. Have any of you all heard of him? The guy's a uh, social psychologist. You know, I don't read a lot of books and watch a lot of TED talks and. I don't know. I don't get that part of you know, 80 percent of kind of what you hear or read. I, I just don't, of course, I do it. This guy, I love this guy. The way he thinks, um, it's incredible. He, he he's given a couple of TED talks. Y'all should look him up. Uh, and he's written a few books. His name is Dan P. He talks about, you know, what he considers to be intrinsic rewards. And he's done a ton of research on this stuff. But what really matters most to people? Um, one of his most famous TED talks is about empowering employees and, and the right incentives for them. And he talks about mastery, empowerment, and autonomy. And so, you know, I put my own kind of words to that, but this idea of, you know, mastery being painting inside the line, right? I'm going to hire uh, Kathy. Kathy is going to come work for Circular Energy, and she's going to be an engineer. And she has a chemical engineering degree, and that's it. Come on. we got a lot of work to do. They teach you the rules. They can show you the line. They can show you the rules. You have to understand the codes. You can learn to be good at that. But when you do, we need to recognize it. We need to let you feel that, hey, you know, I'm getting good at this. It's no different than, you know, my two daughters. Recognize the good things you're doing, not the, you know, the things you're struggling with. Make sure that people feel that they can become masters of what, what they're doing. The next one isn't just hanging inside the lines, but allowing the employees to create them. You know, that, that idea of empowerment. People want nothing more. And guys, I believe this with everything that I am. People want nothing more than to put their fingerprints <coughs> on the business. So it's their business instead of mine. They really want to be able to say, this is how we're going to build this company. This is how we're going to make it look. They make as many mistakes as I do. That's the funny thing. It's just because I'm the CEO. It doesn't mean that my ideas are any better or worse. They're the same. We all have the same value package. Uh, we're not doing that well sometimes. That's doing the right. But let these people... You know, create the lines. Let them kind of decide some of the rules. Let them be empowered to feel like they can make a decision or suggest a change and make a mistake and be wrong and measure it and own up to it, fix it, and move on. And the last one is 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 um, you know autonomy, but not just paint, you know painting the lines, but, but picking the canvas, new directions for the company. I mean, I've had employees tell me, hey, I think we should put solar on those. We can make a fortune off this. Now, I, I hated that idea. Um, you know, we talked about it for a while. But whenever somebody comes to me and says, hey, I, I, I've got an idea. I want to start an O&N division because nobody else in Texas really, truly has one. We want to start an O&N division that can service other solar installer products when they go back. 
Um, the first thing I say is, that comes, okay, go, go do a business plan. I don't say no because it's expensive or yes because it sounds like a good idea. I say go do a, a business plan, come back to me. You know, empower them to come back and show you how it's going to work with them, own it. It's their idea. And then if that guy who came up with that idea wants to do it, guess what? We're going to hand him the piece of the car to go. You now own your own business. You own the circular energy, you own the department. And I think that's empowering. So, you know, probably the biggest takeaway uh, for all you guys is figuring out how to motivate yourself and your colleagues and your employees uh, by making sure that the right incentives are in place. That's, that's all I have to say. Excellent. Yeah.